The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offences. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life. The gain of the wicked to sin. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, the heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. What the wicked dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. When the tempest passes, the wicked is no more but the righteous is established forever. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse. Does not wisdom call? To you, O men, I call, O simple ones, Learn prudence, all fools learn sense. The call of wisdom has been loud and clear. Turn to me and listen. My wisdom is more precious than gold. And we heed the call of wisdom and we say, yes, we want wisdom. We want to listen, but what is wisdom? Well, my dad, he retired um, last year after 41 years working for the same company. I mean, he's an old school kind of guy. And early on in his career, he was on a business trip to Japan. And on the very last evening, uh, his general manager was speaking in front of the team and suggested that they go to a strip club to, for his initiation in the team. Well, standing there in front of everyone, in that very moment, what is the wisdom he needs? What is the wisdom we need to navigate through a complex situation at work or the wisdom in a difficult situation in life? What is wisdom? 
Well, welcome to the School of Wisdom, where you can train to be a sage, to think, to level up your mind, to become wise. Our teacher, the wise sage. Look down to verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. You see, in one sense, chapters 1 to 9 has been an introduction to persuade us to want wisdom. But as we flip the page to chapter 10, we enroll into the school of wisdom, where we train our minds, where we think and become a sage. So welcome to the school of wisdom. A quick orientation before we get into class. Now, there's a shift in the type of proverb as we come to chapter 10. It's what they call antithetical proverbs. Tight comparisons between the first and second line. Now, let me give you an example right there in verse 3. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. It's a tight comparison between the first line and the second line. But how do we understand these proverbs? Two principles. The first, it is dependently true now, but ultimately true then. You see, these proverbs, they don't give us the full picture, uh, just a general truth of life, a slice of life, and all things constant is dependently true now. But the Lord, he does not let the righteous go hungry. But then I hear you say, well, what about the righteous who starve? Well, it will be ultimately true then. In the life to come, there will be no pain, no hunger, no death. Dependently true now, but ultimately true then. That's the first principle. If I want to suggest the second, it's more important and really useful for our time this evening. See, because the main aim of these proverbs is not to find situations that match our life now, but rather it's to help us to, to think. Uh, these comparisons, they are training us to think. And if you were here for the first summer link, uh, you might recall that Tim has already given us a flavor. Uh, take, a verse, take a look at verse 2 as a worked example. Uh, tell me how you finish the sentence. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. You might say, treasures gained by righteousness does profit. But instead, verse 2, what does it say? But righteousness delivers from death. Do you notice there's a gap? Uh, the lines, they, they don't match up. And that means we have to think. And surely you might say, the treasures gained by the wicked, they do profit. They do contribute to the bottom line. And so as we, we think of the gap in between the first and second line, it gives us insight. Well, what is the, the flip side of the second line? Uh, the righteous delivers from death. Well, you would say, wickedness does not deliver from death. That's really interesting if you think about it. Why does treasure gained by the wicked not profit? Well, I'll answer because wickedness, well, it does not deliver from death. It is helpless in the face of death. You see what our master sage is doing? Uh, he is stretching our minds for the definition of what profit means. It is more than just pounds and pennies. So these comparisons, they are training us to think, uh, to stretch our minds, to hold two statements together, to compare and to contrast. We'll do a bit more work on Wednesday in Summer Link, so do come back for that. And maybe that's why the, the call to want wisdom has been nine chapters long. It takes time to be wise. It requires slow, hard thinking. It's not like folly, where instant, inane truths are being dished out. So today, if you are uh, struggling to think and to follow along, uh, it might just be because I'm a bit boring, and if that's the case, I'm sorry. Or it might be that you just need to remember the call of wisdom. Listen to me. Listen to me. See, these comparisons, they train us to think. Okay, enough orientation. 
Again, welcome to the School of Wisdom. And here is our big lesson for today. To be wise is to be righteous. Be wise, be righteous. Look down to verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is sorrow to his mother. Look down to verse 5. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Do you notice there are four types of son being mentioned? But I suppose you could say there are two options. The wise, prudent son, uh, contrasted with the foolish, shameful son. And the appeal from Solomon to his son is to be wise. But what does it mean to be wise? Look at verse 2. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. Uh, it's a call to be righteous, to understand that righteousness is more important than wealth, for it ultimately delivers from death. Well, at this moment, it's worth being precise of what righteousness means here. Well, righteousness probably does not mean being declared legally righteous, like how the word's being used in Romans. And neither does it only mean being morally upright, though it probably would include that. Uh, rather, righteousness here means a life which is orientated towards God, to his lordship, to his rules, his purposes. A godly life, a life orientated towards God. The righteous life contrasted with the wicked life. And it's also to recognize that the Lord, he provides. Look at verse 3. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Uh, you might think that this means that the Lord, he, he rains down Tesco meal deals only on the righteous. But notice Solomon, our wise sage, uh, he's much more nuanced than that. You see, the Lord, he, he does not provide for the righteous apart from the righteous, but through the work of the righteous. Look at verse 4. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is the son who brings shame. See, the righteous, they recognize God's design for work in the world. Men and women created to be workers, and so he, he works hard. Often it's through his hard work that the Lord provides for him. The hand of the diligent the son who gathers and harvests is provided for. But what about the fool? The fool, he ignores God's design for the world. In harvest time, it's time for an extended snooze. His slack hand causes poverty. And so the wise sage, Solomon, he gives us our first lesson. Be wise. Be righteous. Righteousness it's more important than treasure. And as you're righteous, you orient your life toward God, his lordship, his rules, his purposes. And this call to be wise is not only useful for us as individuals, but also for a king. Solomon's son, for all the 700 wives he had and the 300 concubines, it's really interesting that only in the Bible, only one son has been recorded. King Rehoboam, the son whom he hands his kingdom over, the great ancient Israelite kingdom, with full of his treasure in all its resplendent glory. And so imagine that Solomon, on his deathbed, he, he removes his signet ring and he hands it over to Rehoboam, his son. And he says to him, Be wise, be righteous, my son. But here's the problem. As Rehoboam puts the signet ring on his finger, his mind is already wondering, and he thinks, is righteousness really that important? You know, the other nations who do not recognize Yahweh as their God, they're doing all right. And like us, we look around in the world and we wonder, is righteousness really important? Our friends, people who do not recognize Jesus as Lord, 
they're doing all right. Well, here is the next part of a lesson, lesson 1A. The righteous are a blessing, but the wicked cause violence. I want you to notice that verse 6 to verse 11, they seem to function as a teaching unit. Notice the second line in verse 6. But the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Look down to verse 11, the second line. But the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. It's repeated. It seems to be a unit. But the emphasis of this unit seems to emphasize on blessing in life contrasted with violence. Look down to verse 6. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals or alternatively, is covered with violence. Two quick observations on verse 6. Well, the second line is somewhat ambiguous. It could be that the mouth of the wicked covers violence. That is to say, it conceals or deceives or hides violence away. Or alternatively, it could be read that the mouth of the wicked is covered with violence. And that is to say, filled to the brim with violence. It's full of violence. Both are possible readings, but I think the latter seems to fit the unit a bit better. A similar idea to verse 10. Look at verse 10. Whoever wings the eye, it's a funny phrase, isn't it? Whoever wings the eye causes trouble. But he also explains the comparison, I think. A notice is another get proverb, verse 6. Righteousness, uh, righteous is matched with wicked, but blessing, well, it doesn't really match with violence. No, the head, it doesn't match with the mouth. And so we ask, what insight can we glean from the gap? Notice that line one, it describes the outcome. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but what's the flip side? Curses are on the head of the wicked. How about line two? It describes the cause. The mouth of the wicked is covered with violence, but the flip side? The mouth of the righteous is full of peace. And so here's the insight from our sage. Be righteous because your mouth will determine whether you are a blessing. Blessings are found only on those who are righteous because their mouths speak peace, speak truth, speaks life. Like in the words in verse 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. And the opposite is true. Curses are found with the wicked because his mouth is covered with violence. A foolish word here, a lewd joke there. No offer of life, only curses. And so if you're righteous, it would determine whether your mouth would be a blessing or it would be a curse. And also notice the word blessing and life here. Uh, they aren't shallow Christian pleasantries, like, oh, bless, or rather blessing. Uh, it's blessing with capital B. It reminds us of Genesis, uh, the promise of God to Abraham, I will bless you. And it's life with capital L, life with God in the presence of God. Be righteous, because it's only in the righteous that the blessing is found. So that is Solomon's lesson to his son Rehoboam. Be wise, my son, be righteous, and you will be a blessing to the nation. But again, his, his mind has already wandered off. I sure be a blessing, but don't the wicked prosper? And he looks around, the, the kings of Assyria, the kings of Egypt, they are prosperous. And again, we, we look around at those around us, and the wicked, they do seem to prosper. Those who play the game are those who work the system. They prosper in politics or in the office. And so on the surface, it seems that being rich is right. But look at verse 15. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. So is rich right? Well, here is lesson 1b. Be righteous because the wealth of the righteous leads to life, but the wealth of the wicked to sin. Again, notice that verse 12 to 19, well, it functions as another teaching unit. 
Verse 12 starts with hatred and love, covering offense. Verse 18 and 19 ends with covering hatred and mention of transgression or offense. But it seems that the unique contribution of this unit is on wealth and its impact on others. Look down to verse 16. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. Do you see the point that our teacher is making? Wealth is important for a kingdom. He is not anti-wealth. But it's not ultimately how much wealth you have, but how you use it. The righteous one, the one who has his life orientated towards God, would use his life for the kingdom. He would give to the kingdom for the kingdom to grow. He would spend for the kingdom to come. But the wicked would use his wealth that leads to sin. They do not give to the kingdom to come, but rather it leads to sin. And so here is our sage's insight. Being rich is better than being poor, but being righteous is better than being rich. Be wise, be righteous, because it affects your speech, your heart, and also your Barclays account. Righteousness is much more valuable than your wealth. But here's your final objection. What about the wicked who enjoy life now? Or what about the Jeffrey Epstein's in this world who were clearly wicked, enjoyed their life, and they seem to get away really lightly with death. And here's the final part of our lesson, lesson 1c. The Lord will establish the righteous forever, but the wicked will perish. Look down to verse 24. What the wicked dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. When the tempest passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous is established forever. Verse 27. They fear the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but expectation of the wicked will perish. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. Direct comparisons to contrast the outcome of the righteous and the wicked. And the Lord, he will have the last word. The wicked will face the tempest, the final judgment day, and they will perish. But as for the righteous, the Lord will establish them forever. Their lives will be prolonged, and they will dwell in the land and never be moved. You see, YOLO is a misnomer because you don't only live once, rather you actually live twice. Yelp. It's a terrible ring to it, but it presents an accurate picture of reality. You actually live twice. Vinegar for your fish and chips. Not if you agree. Shake your head if you don't. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, salt and vinegar are crisp. Not if you agree. Shake your head if you don't. Yeah, again, it's terrible. <laughs> But well, unfortunately for most of you, Solomon, he agrees with, with me. Uh, what is like vinegar to the teeth? Look down to verse 26. What is like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes? It's a riddle. And what's the answer? So is the sluggard to those who send him. See, this curveball feels very jarring. It's exactly how it reads. And this riddle, verse 26, it comes right in the middle of this teaching unit about the Lord and his final judgment. I mean, such a curious thing. And most of the commentators on this verse, uh, they think it's a random insertion. And you know, you can understand why it feels really, really random. But perhaps our wise sage, he is doing something really clever here. And here's a su suggestion of what he's teaching us. Yes, the Lord's in control. Yes, he would judge on the final day. But whilst you're living, don't be a sluggard. You see, he brings us back to his opening words. Don't be the slack hand that causes poverty. Don't be the shameful son that sleeps in harvest. You know, it may be tempting to think that because the Lord's in control and he would judge on the final day, 
is an excuse to let God, uh, let go, let God, and let me be a sluggard. No, says Solomon. Don't be vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes. The Lord will establish the righteous forever. The wicked will perish. But in the meantime, don't be a sluggard. So welcome to the School of Wisdom, where you train to be a sage. And this is lesson one. What it means to be wise is to be righteous. And this completely contrasts any other alternatives of wisdom in this world. Because the wisdom of man will always be contained in this world, this life, this age. But the lesson from our master sage, he's stretching the horizon and says there's more. There's a God in heaven. Orientate your life to him. There's a life to come. The Lord will have the final say. And though the righteous life may be costly now, it is the life worth living. Righteousness will win, and wickedness will not last. So will you learn from the school of wisdom? Will you store it in your heart? Will you treasure it more than gold, more than fine gold? Or will you be the fool that rejects instruction? You see, it turns out that Rehoboam, you know, he was that fool. He was not a wife's son. His mouth led to violence and to sin. And his father's kingdom, the great Israelite kingdom, was torn in two. Kings after him followed in his footsteps, and the nation cut off from the land. And the Lord, he looked down from heaven, and what did he see? He saw wickedness with no one to intercede. And so what did he do? He strapped on righteousness as a breastplate and as a belt on his waist. And he came forth in the stump of Jesse. And with righteousness, he judged. And with the breath of his lips, he killed the wicked. You see, the Lord came in the person of Jesus to personify wisdom, to model the righteous life in bodily form. He orientated his life towards God. And though he suffered, In this life, he was established forever. And on his head, the blessing of the nations is found. So will you follow the righteous path of your king? Will you heed the call of Lady Wisdom and hold fast to her words? It is the righteous, it is the righteous who will last. And so perhaps you recently moved into London You're really excited about what life in London has in store for you, excited for this new phase of life. Enjoy God's good gifts. Work hard, be diligent, don't be a sluggard. But above all, walk the path of righteousness. And maybe you're in a really complex work situation or a really challenging life circumstance or a really difficult relationship. And often in such situations, the the solution and the answer is not really clear. And this may not offer a direct answer to your problems, but whatever the case, always choose the path of righteousness. Often it's more costly in the present, but remember, it's only the righteous that will last. And so, there's my dad in front of his general manager, the desire to be accepted, the desire to be liked, his career at stake. What would Lady Wisdom say to him? Be wise, be righteous. And so you can imagine the look on the face of the general manager when his offer was politely refused. He threw a fit and his mouth was literally covered with violence filled to the brim. And so he got a cab, and he got all of them in the cab to go back to the hotel in complete silence. Well, that's a cab ride you probably don't want to be on. And so a few weeks later, my my dad, he was transferred to a different department, uh, which probably had a profound impact on his career. But yet 35 years after that incident, on his final day at work, he gave a retirement speech on everyone on the floor and his CEO present. Most of them already knew that he was a Christian and that he walked with integrity. 
And in his speech, he shared briefly about his faith. And that gave rise to speak words of life to someone. Was, was he vindicated? Well, I guess you would say so. Will he be vindicated in the future? Well, you bet he will. See, only the righteous will last, but the wicked will perish. So be wise and be righteous. Here's a quick preview for lesson two. Yes, righteousness will win, but at times it's not immediately clear who is really righteous and who is really wicked. How do you look beneath the surface? How do you discern what's behind the mask? For that, you need to come back next week. Let me pray. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Father, we give you great thanks for your Son who was truly wise, the Lord Jesus, the one who shows us what it means to love righteousness and abhor wickedness, the one who has proven that you do indeed establish the righteous forever. And Father, as we set our eyes on that hope, please would you make us wise in the present. And we ask this for his sake and your glory. Amen.